So I want to minister this morning, and I'm going to jump straight into it. And to, to get the full context, you're going to have to go back for the last couple of weeks online. You can go to YouTube or website, and you will be able to pick it up from there. But if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus, it's deep into the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. It's called Leviticus chapter 14. It's the book that most of us never read. We start it, we can't kind of understand it. The Lord spoke to Moses, da, 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 and go like, I don't understand the uh, um, clean bird, cedar wood, scarlet yarn, the priest, the brother. <laughs> Let me carry on. Okay, let's go to Numbers. Uh, no, that's okay. Deuteronomy. Okay, let's go to Joshua. How many of you have skipped uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers? <laughs> Um, we need to be a people to read the whole Bible. Oh, Blaze must go. Sorry. So the teenagers, if you haven't gone, let the Blaze begin. High school students. All right. So we're in Leviticus chapter 14. And this is a, a scripture that I think we should stand. I'm going to read it. Come on, let's stand together and honor his word. This is Probably you've never read it before, or if you did, you didn't know what it was all about. So here's to a morning where you're going to learn something about God's Word. So here it is, verse 33. It'll come up there, or you can do it on your, in your Bibles or on your phones or whatever. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, now, just to say, they're not in the promised land. They are still on their way to the promised land, and God is speaking to them. And he says, when you come into the land of Canaan, that's the land that God promised, which I will give you as a possession. Say possession. possession. Do you know that God has given you possession? He's given you promises, and he wants you to walk into that. He says, when I give you it for a possession, and I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession. So just to, the best way that the translators of the Bible has been able to to translate this is, it wasn't really leprosy, as in the medical diagnosis of leprosy. It was a, a white or a, a marking, the, 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 the direct translation would be mark. He says, when I mark your house with something that oozes or something that, that is going to come out of the walls of your house, um, so hey, how many of you have had a damp rising anywhere, you know, you kind of, you know, right near the bottom of your walls, you just, and then the plaster begins to, okay, in a bathroom or somewhere, so you would understand it's similar to that, okay, it says, then what you've got to do, the one who owns the house shall come to the priest, there seems to be some case of this marking in my house, then the priest will command that, the, that they empty the house before the priest goes to examine the disease, lest all the house be declared unclean. And afterwards, the priest shall go to the house. He shall examine the disease, the walls. If the disease in the walls of the house has a greenish or reddish spot, like a coppery or gold that leeches, you'll see now why it is, okay? It appears to be, sorry, greenish or reddy spots, and it appears to be deeper. Say deeper. Than the surface. In other words, it's a little bit deeper on. Then the priest shall go out of the house, and the door of the house shall be shut in the house for seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day, and look if the disease has spread in the walls of the house. If the, then the priest shall command that they take out the stones in which this mark, this disease, and throw them into an unclean place out of the city. Say out of the city. And he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around the plaster, take it out, make it clean, verse 42, and they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other plaster and plaster the house. Drop down to verse 40, 48. But if the priest comes and looks, if the disease is not spread in the house, after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, for the disease is healed. And for the cleansing of the house, he shall take two small birds of, and a cedar wood, a scarlet yarn, and hyssop, 
and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. And he shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and the scarlet yarn, along with the live bird, and dip them in the blood of the bird that was killed and in the fresh water, and sprinkle the house seven times. Thus you shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with fresh water and with the live bird and with the cedar wood and hyssop and the scarlet yarn. And he shall let the live bird go out of the city into the open country. And so he shall make atonement for the house and it shall be clean. Say clean. clean. Lord, today would you bring your living word into our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. Now, how many of you have found that passage a little weird and kind of, how many of you have never read or heard that passage before? It's just like, is that in the Bible? All right. So let me give you some context because God was preparing his people for what is to come. Do you know that God has gone ahead of you and is preparing you for what is to come? That he knows your tomorrow, he knows the decisions that you need to make, and he's preparing you now for what is to come. I believe that God is doing a significant work in each one of our hearts and lives, and he's preparing us for what is to come. This is one area that, as a parallel or as a parable, can be helpful. So, as Israel was going to go and take over this foreign land, God had promised them that he would give them this Beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. It was a prosperous land. It was a land that produced. Remember the spies came back with massive grapes and there was lots of prosperity there. And the Canaanites who lived in this land, they were evil, they were untov, and we've been talking about this word goodness. And the title of my message is if we will allow the goodness of God to go beneath the surface of our heart. Goodness overcomes evil. And so there was this land that was full of evil, but it was prosperous. And these people, what they would do is to take care of their wealth. They would turn their wealth into gold, or gold would be their wealth. And then they would take the gold and shape it into idols of which they would worship. Don't think too different to today, where we take our wealth and put it into uh, some metal with four wheels and worship it or other areas of our lives. There are idols all over, isn't it? Now, I'm not wanting to dig at idols or cars or houses and that. All I'm going is, is that nothing has changed in man's heart. And so what they would do is they would turn, take their wealth, put it into an idol, but these were wealthy. These were, you know, I mean, this was their money. So what they would do is they didn't have banks where they could take it to, So part of their culture was that they would hide it in the walls of their houses, kind of like a a safe. They didn't have lock and key, but what they did have is that they would take it and maybe take out a stone from the wall, and then they would make a a cubby hole in the back there, put their wealth there to store it, put the stone back. Now they knew it was, you know, one meter from here, one meter from there, that's where it was. So when Israel came into the land, God knew that the people of the land, because he had said, I'm going to give you cities you did not build. I'm going to give you orchards you didn't plant. I'm giving you a wealthy land. I'm giving you a land that is miraculous. It's not a land of miracles. It's a miraculous land. And you will plant and you're going to reap and you're going to get houses. And so as the Israelites came into that land, they would take these cities and there were beautiful homes in those places. And they moved in, they killed the people and they moved into these houses. But they did not know that there was idols that were hidden in the walls of these of their house by a previous tenant or the previous owner. So the parable that I want us to see is that we've all had a previous owner or a tenant in some ways of our hearts. We are born in sin and the owner of our heart was the father of lies. The enemy of heaven is a liar. He cannot tell truth. And so he will only bring evil He will only bring lies. He will only want to destroy. He'll only want to kill the purposes and plans of God for us. 
And so as a tenant in our heart, he may have hidden these lies and these things deep into the walls of our heart that we do not even know. And when we come to Christ and we find salvation in him and the grace of God through faith, we are born again. What happens is we go from darkness to light. We go from the father of lies to the father of truth. He is the God who adopts us into his family. He restores us to our plans, the plans and purposes that he has for us. We are born again and become children of God. There is a new owner of our lives. And his name is Jesus. Now as we do that, we are washed by the blood of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I want us to know is that when you look at all the sacrifices in this Old Testament and you look at these things, it can be a little difficult to read. It can be like, gee, they kill a bull and then a sheep and then this and then you take some blood and you put it there and you put it there. And you go like, this is all very confusing. I want to say is that if you keep your focus on Jesus, it'll become clearer because everything points towards Jesus Christ. And Paul helps us understand it because when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, Christ, who is our Passover, who is our sacrifice, he's become our Passover. That was when they were, came out of Egypt, they had to slaughter a lamb, put the blood on the doorposts, and that was their coming out of sin and into a whole new uh, life with God. Now, it points to the sacrifice of Christ. So that's just how we always look back and take these back to Christ. So we understand that when we're born again, it is through the price that Christ paid on the cross for us. Our sins were a scarlet, Isaiah says. That our righteousness, he also goes on to say, is like filthy rags. There was no good in us. There was nothing good about us. Yet God still loved us so much that he came and gave himself for us so that we could have everlasting life. And everlasting life starts now. We don't get everlasting life when we die or if Jesus comes again before that. We get everlasting life. We get life in abundance. We get the Zoe life of God the moment we surrender our lives and the tenant that has occupied the illegal squatter that's come into our hearts because of sin is expelled and God Almighty comes in by the power of the Holy Spirit and we are no longer in death or darkness, but we have life and light. And we get to live in the abundance of God by His grace now forevermore. So what has this story got to do with it, Craig? Well. The thing is, we are born again, saved, set free. Our sins are forgiven. There's not a sin problem. Friends, I want to tell you that we don't have a sin problem if you're born again. You may sin, but it's not a sin, it's not a problem because it's been taken care of at the cross. But what we may face is some dysfunction. In other words, in our series as we're talking, we're looking at the goodness of God. This word good, it means in the Hebrew, it's the word tov. Say tov. Tov means excellent, beautiful. But it means to have intended design or purpose, or it means to work the way it was intended to work. When God created the world, and as he finished the day, he stood back and he said, it is tov. It is good. Why? Because he created it to work the way it was intended to work. When he had finished the creation, he stood back and he said, there's six days, it's all good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But as they work together, he said, it's very good. For us as a church, I believe that God's calling us to be a very good church. Is that it's you're good and you're good and you're good and you're good and you're good. I'm not saying that you, that you are without sin or without sin and without sin. We're all sinners saved by grace. I'm not saying we should go out and sin, 
But I'm saying is that you are good because you are designed to work the way God intended you to design, uh, to work, to be your purpose. Why are you on this planet? That's why we're doing a short course on Know Your Why. Because when we know our why and our purpose, then we can fulfill it. And in that, as we be, work that through with God as our master and work here, that it's good. We don't become good. We are good because he is good. We're not working our way to goodness. Goodness is working us into our purpose. Goodness overcomes evil. That's what Romans says. Paul's talking to the Romans. And he says, you got to over now. We're not saying goodness overcomes sin. Hear it. It's goodness overcomes dysfunction. We all have dysfunction in our lives, don't we? Anybody here know there's no dysfunction? There's, there's these areas that we are not operating as God intended us to be. God is so committed to us, he says, I'm going to give you my goodness so that it overcomes your dysfunction. It overcomes our untov, or our, as the Bible, the translators say, evil. And that word is ra. It was the chief god of the Egyptians, ra. God is committed to helping us operate and live well in our intended design. And as you become function and better, and you, and we all begin to function, 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 we become very functional, and the church begins to be who it's called to be. But we've got to start with ourselves. There was this uh, story told of a man who tried to change the world. He's like, he's 30 years old, he's going to go out and change the world. So he went out, and he went all over the world traveling, and he tried to get, and for 10 years, he tried to get the world to change become good. And he, he's like, oh, after 10 years, I gave up. He says, I'm going back. I'm going to try to change my nation. And he went back. And for 10 years, he tried to change his nation. And he worked and he worked, but it, he couldn't change it. And, and then at the end of 10 years, he decided, no, I, I'm going to go change my city. And so he worked for another 10 years to change his city. And he tried to do this and become this and do that, become the mayor and all that. And he didn't work. And he thought, what am I going to do? Uh, let me go and change the neighborhood. And so he gave himself another 10 years to do that. And at the age of 70, he realized that if he had changed himself, he could have changed the neighborhood, which would have changed the city, which would change the nation, which would change the world. And God has called us not to go out there and try and protest and be this and do that. God has called us, let the goodness of God into our lives. When we do that, our lives change. We become as I intended design the purposes of God, and then we can help our family, and our family can help others, and then the church, and the church in the neighborhood, and this church, and that church, and that church, and 3CI, and the condo, we come, and together we become very good. So back to this portion of scripture. <laughs> and here we see is that God is so wise that he warns them that he's get, when you get there and this happens, there's a way to do it. So look, let's look at what he does. He says, if you see a mark in your house, in your home, now let's go to the parable, let's go to the spiritual, let's go to you and me. If you see a mark, a reoccurring mark, that's not just a surface level thing, but it has a deep root. See, what I found is that most times the issue is not the issue. Is that true? It's like you're getting a headache and a continuous headache, so you just keep taking panada, 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 but it's masking. That's the surface issue or the surface presentation, the mark, but the deeper issue is something hidden deep down. And so what we see is we can see issues and marks of untov, of raw, coming out of our hearts. But the reality is, is that it was because the previous tenant of our heart, he hid it in the walls of art. We may not even know. But what happens is, is it says that when I, say I, I. not you, God. So when God wants to deal with something, let him deal with it. Because if we start dealing with it and going looking for the idols of our heart, we start chopping the whole house down. And we can create a big mess trying to sort out a problem that only God can sort out. You see, psychologists can help, but they can never heal. Amen. Now, if you're a psychologist, I want to go, you are necessary and needed in our community. 
But a psychologist told me this. He said, Craig, there's one thing I want you to know. Is that psychologists are helpful, but they cannot heal. Only Jesus heals. And so we can be helpful, but Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit, can also understand psychology better than any other psychologist and get to the root of the problem. And how he does that is through the Word of God. Because the Word is likened to a two-edged sword that is so sharp it can go deep down because we don't really know where soul, spirit, body, it's all kind of... But there's things deep in there that God who is our creator and maker knows exactly when and where and what to deal with. And what we need to do is allow him to do it. So this is what he says. He says, if it comes to more, go to the priest. But surely, why don't you go to a builder? I mean, if, if your house is, is like got damp rising, you know, why would you go to the elder, you know, why would you come to Warren, he knows nothing about, you know, damp rising in a in house, you come to Craig because he's the builder, you know, because actually this is a picture of us going to the high priest Jesus, so there's this mark, there's this reoccurring pattern, there's this ugliness, there's this, any of you are experiencing this thing, it's like it just keeps reoccurring, comes back whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's financially, whether it's emotionally, whether it's this depression or difficulties and situations and circumstances. And, and you know, it's not just one day. It doesn't just happen and then it never happening. again. It's a deep-rooted, deep-seated issue. The thing is, is that God wants to deal with it. And this is how he does it. He says, come to me, all you who are weary, and are heavy laden, he says, I'll give you rest, I'll bring peace to your soul. He says, this is how you do it. So he tells him, you see, let's just go to quickly, just go to Matthew chapter 9, and the guys won't get it up there, so if you can just dial there, Matthew chapter 9, and verse, uh, where is it, 35. Um, It says, and Jesus went through all the cities, now this is speaking about the goodness of God, the good God, God himself, Jesus, went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Say affliction. Affliction is where it is. So there's disease and affliction. He's going, and Jesus went everywhere, and where everywhere he went, as goodness came, evil went. As goodness came, diseases were healed. As goodness came, affliction went. And to the issues that were deeper, Jesus knew just how. Because to some he touched, to some he spoke. To some he never even went, but faith healed. You can't put God in a box and say you have to do it this way or that way. What we can do is to see that Jesus comes as the healer of disease and affliction. And so when you are afflicted with this kind of reoccurring stuff, issue, is that you go to Jesus and you say, Hey, Lord, here's my heart. You want to deal with something? And he goes deep down like a surgeon into that. Because there is an idol, there is something, an attachment. There is some relational attachment, some, uh, a lie. Mostly they are lies that the, you are believing. Someone said to you something and you believed it. A previous relationship has told you that you are ugly or someone evil raped you. Someone came and abused you. Someone and you feel shame. You feel you can't get clean. Every time you go into a shower, you want to clean yourself, but you can't get clean because there is an attachment that has come that is evil. Now, I'm not talking about soul ties. I'm talking about relational attachments that are evil. They're not good. (laughs) They are raw. (laughs) And God wants to deal with that, and he deals with it very quickly and easily. Because what he says is, you need to go to that, where there's a mark, where there's this, you can't get free, you can't get free. There's a dream that reoccurs, or there is an issue. And if you can't find it in your relationship with God, You can go to a priest, come to a leader, go to somebody that prays for you, somebody that loves you, somebody that cares for you. This week I I got home and Andy wasn't there. I thought the rapture had taken place and I got left behind. (laughs) And I'm going like, this is, this is, this is, 
this is not good, you know, because she's normally at home and I get home later. But I'm home and she's not home. And then, you know, she's like, comes home. But she'd been seeing somebody who'd got to the end of their tether, got to the end of the reoccurring pattern, the, the, this thing, which was just, and saying, please, I need some help. I want to say, if you're there, please seek help. And then best as we can, we will, we will help. But our help is not to be the solution to the problem. Our help is to point you to the solution. His name is Jesus. Our help is to work you through it. It's not to, to help expose the lie, to help expose the act or the situation, to help bring clarity to a situation, to help you understand that God is, you see, because if I set you free, then I've got to keep you free. But if you find your freedom in Christ, Christ keeps you free and you can keep being set free because you understand how to do it. Today, I'm giving you the help to know how to set yourself free and keep yourself free. Now, we're going to face this all the time. And you realize that you think that, you know what, I've got no dysfunction. When we are absolutely perfect, um, it will only be on that side of, of death. But while we're on this side walking, the, the, we realize that actually there are areas that need to be dealt with. And my greatest fear is for those of us who have traveled the longest with Christ, is that we get to the point where we stop growing and we think we've made it. And we don't have anything more to deal with. But God wants to keep dealing with us, to keep dealing with our dysfunction, so that we can function as He intended to be. The enemy's greatest strategy is to keep those with the most experience, the most money, the most purpose away from God's purpose. You young people are right now are just like, God, oh, give me anything. God, you hear that? But the older generation has walked, and then we've picked up these offenses and a little bit of bitterness here, and we complain here, and we're doing this here, and you know, we got this. And, and how do you know you have an issue in the heart? Just listen to what's coming out your mouth. Doctors used to, before they just hooked you up in a machine and sent you for 10,000 blood tests, what they would do is they'd take an ice cream uh, uh, stick and they'd say, say, ah. <laughs> and then they'd put this and they just looked at what was on your tongue. If you want to know how good what's happening in the heart, the Bible says just see what's coming out the tongue. <laughs> you can see if there's issues. <laughs> you just hear it. And so we need each other to go, hey, I think that that's a little bit of of raw, and let me, why don't you go to Christ who can bring healing, because he heals every affliction. And how does he do it? Well, he says, just go to the wall, cut the bricks out, and throw them outside the city. In other words, it's through repentance, it's through recognizing, oh dear, I do have a problem. There is an issue deep down. But if you keep focusing on the problem, you will never get to the solution. If you're kind of like, oh, this is, you know what, it's amazing. Oh, I've got this problem. Some people are addicted to problems. And when they come into your life, they're just telling you about the problems. And they just so, and if they don't, they want another problem so they can tell you about another problem. Instead of going, I want to tell you about the solution that Christ brought to me. We focus on the solution, not the problem. And what is the solution? Well, get it out. <laughs> Cut it out. Take it out and throw it away. Beat it up. Get rid of it. The problem is the addiction, the, the, addict, the urban recovery guys, as I was talking, talking to them, they say, one of the things is, could you imagine finding a couple of gold bars in the walls of your house, but they were like shaped to idols that were worshipped? How many of you want to just go like, can I just keep one? <laughs> can I just keep this thing? <laughs> And the thing is that we hold on to stuff that the enemy has put there when God wants to give us so much more. God wants to give us so much more, and truth overcomes evil. So we've got to get to the truth, but we, we either do this, we take it out and we hold on, and then we put this little idol on our mantelpiece and go, this is what I found in my life, you know, and this is what's, you know, you go like, that thing should have been tossed way away. Why? And we leave a gaping hole in our wall and we take our guests through and go, like, there's this hole. I remember when God spoke to me, we moved into a new house. And the first night we moved in, we had um, unwelcome guests. And as I shouted at them to get out in the name of Jesus, they let off a, um, a firearm, a gunshot. And uh, fortunately, no one was hurt. And 
They ran away. But the next day we saw there was this like big hole in the wall where the gunshot had hit. You know, it was like big. It's like, and I left it there. <laughs> it was like, look at, and everybody came in, where's the gunshot? You know, and I realized we're celebrating and, and that's just like we do. It's like, we, we, hey, where's that part of you? And you go like, oh, look at this. this is my, I plastered it over. So I don't want to see that again because I don't want to glorify that. I want to glorify the fact that God took care of me, not a gunshot. But we're so, we're so, Bias, aren't we, towards making the hole in the wall or the idol that was found. Guys, get rid of it quickly. Chuck it away. Put it outside the city. Put it out of your life. Get rid of it. There are some things, and I, I want to say this because, okay, let me not go down there. Okay, get it out. And then this is the most important part is you have to go because, as you remember in the story, it says, You've got to go and cut new stone. New stone. Say new stone. new stone. Cut new stone and put it back. What is that? It's to go and get the truth that God has said. Because these things that are caught in the walls of our heart are lies. They are abuses. They are things that are going to hold us. And when we get rid of them, we can get the truth of God. It's this good word. When we start, I speak the name of Jesus it is because his name and his word are linked. <laughs> so when we begin to prophesy and we speak the name of Jesus, we get new truth. So we look and it says that you were ugly. And that's why and you believe that you are ugly. But God says you are beautiful. And you cut that out and you put that on your, wind, on your mirror and you stick it on your, on, your, on your dashboard and you put it everywhere until that truth goes deep into the area of your heart that once told you you were this, but now God wants to tell you you are that. That takes time, that takes effort, and only you can do that. Who was here? Pray for me, Craig. I could cast a demon out, but if you leave a hole in your heart, Something else will come and possess that. So put truth back, put truth back, put truth back. Some of you have dealt with some things, but you've never put the truth back. You need to go and get the truth of God's word. That's why we love God's word. That's why we read it and study it. That's why we read it all. We don't skip leg day. We don't skip arm day or whatever it is. Because if you skip Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy... You're going to be skinny believers, weak believers. You're going to be useless believers. Why? Because you have left. You see, here it is. I remember, but, and I got a revelation of this. Let me tell you quick stories. Is that for the first about 10 years of our marriage, is that we grew up, I grew up in a Christian home. Andy, his parents found Christ a little bit later on, but they were Christians. Uh, Andy, all her, uh, 13, I think you came to Christ. Uh, I'm nine years old, all of that. So we were good people, we thought, until we got married. And then we found World War Four, Five, Six, Seven happen. And I don't know what happened, but every time we'd have a little scrap, it became a massive explosion. And so we would describe it like others had, had marriages that were, you know, calm ponds. We had a stormy sea. Maybe you, you, you're identifying. And so, you know, we would have a little argument, but it would be a massive fight in the end. And then I began to go like, okay, this is, there's something happening again and again. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I started asking, in reading scripture, I'm going, God, there's this. There's, there's something here deeper in. As I began to get revelation of this and other books that I read and things, and God began to speak, and I, I realized that what was happening is that there was some, the best way I can ex, uh, explain it is there were fuses that were laid in the generations of our lives that would come, came into our marriage. And so if we had a little disagreement, little like spark, it was like that whole, our whole marriage, this thing was charged with gas. So a little spark, boom! And I was like, this is ridiculous. This says, this is not, we all have a little scrap in our marriages and things, but this was supernatural and not godly supernatural. And I'll never forget that night. I had this revelation and I came to Andy and I was like, whew, she's going to love this revelation. And, I, and we were there, the fire was going. I said, this is going to end beautifully here. But let me just give the the, the 
the revelation. And she was sitting there by the fire. And I told her, and she said, yeah? I said, well, we need to pray. She says, okay, pray. And I, I can never forget, she was there. She was on this little coffee table, and she said, okay, pray, Greg. <laughs> and I'm going, like, that's not the response really I want. I want you to stand with me. I want you to be in faith. I want you, this is it. Come on. Why? But uh, you see, what I brought in was control. When I wanted to sort out a situation, if we had this, I just got big, loud, and, and, and large, and I would shout, and I just wanted to go, you will sort this out before the sun goes down. The Bible says that before the sun goes down, you must do this. We're going to sort this out. And she just went back and back and back and back. And here I was going forward and forward and forward, and, and it was just explosive. And I don't think I ever did it as bad as that, did I? Maybe I did. I was bad. And so she would try and manipulate through emotional sabotage, and I would just try and get very strong. I never hit, I never did that, but I would get loud. I became like a turkey. You know what a turkey does? <laughs> so I realized that we needed, and this thing came through generations, through our parents. And I just... Prayed that night while Andy was like this. I'm going like, I didn't feel faith. I was like despondent because it wasn't the kind of, and then I realized that actually the spirit was making us, because I wanted to get, like you stand up girl, and the you, you, and I realized, God, I need to act in the opposite spirit. I just prayed. I said, God, these generational fuses that have come into our marriage, would you break them now in the name of Jesus? And I thought heaven would applaud and lightning would come down and she would get up and she would say, let's make love and all that, but she didn't. <laughs> it was just like we went to bed. But I want to tell you that we both looked back to that moment and it said this. Yeah. Never again has been that. Yes, we had scraps. Yes, we done. But that thing was dealt with right there and then. there yeah, you came with you. A young man came to me and he's, he was being in the church. He was the most eligible bachelor in the church. A bit like JB. You know, JB, just stand up. JB, we need to get you married. You know, hey, before you, Cameron, before you applaud too much, you can stand up. Any other guys here, young gentlemen, you know, we need to get you married. So there was this, you know, and there were lots of beautiful young ladies. And, and I'm going like, he came to me, he said, I can't find a wife. I said, are you kidding me? There are so many beautiful, it's a bit like now. It's like so many beautiful girls here. What's wrong with you guys? Is there something wrong with you? And like, so I said, what's wrong with you? You know, anyway, no, we, had a, we had a friendship, but he was genuine, you know. So I, the Holy Spirit just asked me, I just started asking questions. I said to him, bud, what's happened in your past? And I said, have you ever had a relationship in which you gave yourself wholly to, to that person? He said, yeah, we were engaged. I said, you what? He said, yeah, I was engaged. And then, you know, it broke off. He said, it was like, I said to him, you know what, but... It's like you're a half a person. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you've given the best part of her, yourself away. So whenever you meet somebody else, it's like they, they're going like, I don't want to marry a half a person. You're a half a person. I'm worried. And this is one of the reasons I'm preaching this. I'm worried that you young people are walking around half a people. And that's the reason why we're not getting some marriages happening. Because that's how God spoke to us. Members stay, build Give your daughters and sons in marriage. We need a marriage thon. Marathon. Marriage thon. Anyway, you, you, it's time. The time is gone, guys. Okay. So I said to him, he said, what must I do? I said, well, you know, here it is. Let me, I took him to, to Leviticus, and I said, there's something there. Like, I don't believe in soul ties, but I do believe in relational attachments. Something's attached. Abuse attachment. Evil attachment. There's good attachment. It says the heart and soul of David and Jonathan were knit. That was a good, it's good. When you come together in marriage, it's a good attachment. You need to have that. The problem is sometimes I think, and many times, people are getting married, but they've got relational attachments that are outside of the marriage. Every time we sleep with someone else, there is a relational attachment. You go like, guys, you shouldn't sleep before you, with someone else, another, with, before you get married. You think that's a horrible legal law. It's for your good. 
God doesn't give this thing to you for your bad. He's saying, you're going to come in with a whole lot of relational attachments. And those relational attachments are going to create chaos and havoc and untov and evil in your marriage. It may not be that. It may be other things. It may be finance that has a re- a, an effect. You get what I'm saying? He came back to me a little while. He says, I, I, he says Craig, I, I dealt with it. I said, brilliant, but it wasn't, I don't know, four or five weeks later. I mean, he came running. I'll never forget. He came running down the aisle to me in the front. He just said, Craig, I found my wife. And they were married. They're still married. They are friends. And I go, thank God for a moment where I was able to see a problem beneath the surface to help them. Now, please don't start phoning me tomorrow and also come for that. But if you get stuck, we're here to help you. I want you to know that. Come, let's stand. I'm sorry it's taken long. I thought it was going to be short. I know you worshipped long this morning. Yeah. How many enjoyed the worship this morning? Wasn't it amazing? Okay, I want to finish with this. So you go and take Leviticus and you go and read this again. Leviticus 14. But did you find the end of that chapter a little bit weird? Like take two little birds, um, some fresh water, some cedar hyssop and scarlet and, 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 and kill the one and do this and set the free. It's like, I want you to see this. This is beautiful. Where? This is beautiful. Because this is the picture that I want you to get. Because it was after the house was declared clean, he says, now go and celebrate. He didn't say, if you want freedom, this is what you have to do. You have to go and get two birds. You have to work. You have to do this. You have to do this. And then you get that. He says, what you have to do is go to the high priest, repent, take that idol, suck it out. When you've seen your freedom, he says, I want you to come back because I want you to come back to a simple meal. Now, this isn't, wasn't a meal, but you know what it speaks of? Because it was two birds. The one was killed. And it was a picture of what Christ had done. This is a picture for us. This was signifying that Christ would die, but the, he would rise again because the other bird was set free. What they had to use was, was hyssop and cedar, and there's all sorts of significance there. But they had to take scarlet. And remember, what, what, what our scarlet is, is, our sins are like scarlet, but he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. This wasn't to get us clean. We are already clean in Christ. He is our new owner. By grace, we live in the freedom, but yet we have to deal with our dysfunction. And when we've dealt with our dysfunction, we come out and we exclaim the goodness of God. And we say, when we come together, now Christ has given us not a ritual of hyssop and this and that. He's given us a simple meal that says, you know what? We are one loaf. And each of us, as we break the bread, it's a, it's a memory that we are very good together. So we break it and we share it because not because his body was broken. His body was not broken. The Bible says that not one bone of his body was broken. But we break the, the bread to share it so that we can. Don't drop the bread, the body of Christ there. <laughs> but this is that the reason we don't go and stand by a wall and do it ourselves and look all religious the reason we at urban life do this with abundance because we come together and we say god is good because i once was a murderer and god helped me i once was an adulterer i once was raped and i was abused but i want to tell you of the goodness of god i'm set free i'm free i once was but now i want to 